grace, peace to you. Welcome to worship this morning at Hickory Hills Presbyterian Church. If you are ready, hold on, I have announcements for you, and then some. Um, first off, Grace Seeds Ministry is the organization last year that several of us got seedlings and seeds from, if you remember that. They are an organization that is intent upon sharing God's creation and in encouraging us to share produce of the land with each other. So if you are a gardener, or if you are somebody who likes to put something in your pot on the window, whether that is vegetable or herb, Jenny has a sign-up sheet for you if you would like to claim some seedlings. Grace Seeds Ministry grows all of their seedlings, and then they deliver to the church. And we got them last year, I believe, around Mother's Day. Uh, maybe it was the week after. But if you are in need, of or would like seeds or seedlings, please sign up following worship. Let's see, where do I start? Today, there is a deacons meeting following worship. We will say 1115. Deacons, you have a meeting. Our next community meal is a week from Monday. Debbie is here. If you would like to assist, I'm sure she will put you to work. Just let her know. On May 7, we have a piano recital being presented to us by our very own Greg at 3 p.m. So come, enjoy music, enjoy fellowship. There will be a simple reception following the recital. If you are willing to set up, clean up, or bring some snacks, there is a sign-up sheet on the table outside of the sanctuary. If you are willing to bring something or to assist in that, would you please, please put your name on the paper? I would appreciate it. Recognition Sunday is May 14. If you have graduates in your life, uh, we need to know about them. And so please be in communication with myself or with Bernie about graduates. We don't want to inadvertently miss someone. And then finally, our sale, the indoor yard sale, is coming up very, very quickly. If you wander downstairs, you will notice that there is a lot of furniture that has already arrived around here. That furniture has to be tucked away in nooks and crannies because we have some things happening at the church. So, number one, if you and you are a member of this church and you know that you have already claimed something, would you please just tell us, pay for it, and get it out of here, by all means? You do not need to wait until the sale unless it is so far back into the mess that we can't get it out for you. So if you already know that you're claiming something, please do so and get it. Number two, if you have things that you would like to bring to donate, you are more than welcome to bring those. Next week, please. Next Sunday, fair game. The first, fair game. Give us one more week of not having the gym full of stuff, and then we can begin to really gather the rest of the items. And just a reminder, we are not doing clothes. Shoes, scarves, accessories, yes. Clothing, there are lots of wonderful organizations that you can donate clothing to. I'll happily give you a list, okay? Are there any other announcements? I know that's a lot. Most of it's in your bulletin. So take it home and highlight what you need to know because odds are you won't remember half of what I just said. Let's worship our God together. Has agreed to pick up whatever furniture is left, providing it's worthwhile for them to come and do so. But they use the furniture to help uh, families who have been burned out of their apartments. They'll provide a you know, whole, whole new family, uh, new uh, furniture for them. And for ladies who may be leaving uh, an abusive, uh, uh, well, in an abusive relationship. So they can use the furniture. They have agreed to, to take whatever is left. 
However, if you really want stuff, take it. <coughs> Let us begin now with our call to worship. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God, God's people. This is the good news. Christ, our peace, meets us here in worship and sends us out to share the peace of Christ with all we meet. O oh God, when we do not recognize your work in the world, may our hearts burn within us. When we feel lost, may we cling in faith to your word and the power of bread broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Send your spirit among us now that as we worship, we might know your eternal presence. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 248 in the hymnal, Christ is Risen, shout Hosanna. People of God, the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Trusting in God's compassion, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Lord, you come to us, but we do not recognize you. You call, but we do not follow. You command, but we do not obey. You bless us, but we do not always thank you. Lord, you accept us, but we do not accept others. You forgive us, but we do not forgive those who wrong us. You love us, but we do not love our neighbors. Forgive us, we pray. Change our hearts. Help us to live as you have commanded and called. Amen.
Hear the good news. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. <coughs> people of God, as forgiven people, we are welcomed and we are sent out. And so would you take a moment to share that peace, that assurance with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, 34th Psalm in particular. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him, and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried, and was heard by the Lord, and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. This is the word of the Lord. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned, I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again, amazing love. Be. 
that you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. That you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. joining the people as they witness the resurrection. This is a familiar story, but I would invite you to notice. Notice, even though we are done with our theme, Food for the Soul, that we did during Lent, notice just how often food is a part of the resurrection story as well. This is Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. Now on that same day, 
that is Easter. Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know about the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, this is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary the Messiah should suffer these things, then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked on ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord is risen. Indeed, he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, we explored the story of Thomas and the rest of the disciples, the way in which their faith was assured, or they were made confident in the resurrection by seeing, and the fact that it is easier to see and believe, then it is either easier to believe without seeing. Today we returned to Easter, that very first day, when only the women had seen Jesus. Cleopas and his friend are journeying to Emmaus. The road was uphill and windy. It's about seven miles, we are told, and it would have been a well-worn path, wide enough probably for a cart, so we ought not imagine big paved streets, but rather wide dirt tracks. Seven miles is not very far if you are used to walking all over the place. But if you walk with a heavy heart, when you are sad, when you are burdened, we trudge, don't we? We don't walk with a light step when we're sad. We journey. We trudge. We take heavy footsteps. You have probably all had walks like this. We have, as God's people, through dark valleys and hard places. We don't know the reason for their journey. We don't know why Cleopas and his friend are choosing to leave Jerusalem this day rather than 
earlier or later, but we know that their hearts are heavy. They are confused and frightened. They are perplexed, full of grief and sorrow, and sadness and anger or joy. And so perhaps it's not a surprise that a stranger walking at a regular pace would catch up to them as they walked. It would be only natural as you journeyed to fall in conversation with the people who you met on the road. There is safety in numbers in uncertain territory, and so walking together is not a bad plan. As they walked, they told their story to this stranger, the story of their loss, their confusion. They wonder and they are uncertain. What they know for sure is that their teacher, the one they thought was the Messiah, has been put to death. How could they have gotten it so wrong? We thought, they say, he was the one to redeem Israel, to bring Israel back to God's plan. What is more, they are now not just sad at the loss of their teacher, but they are deeply confused because the women insist that Jesus has risen. The women insist that the body is missing, and not only that, but he is alive. But can they trust them? They can't see it. How do we believe it? So maybe their walk to Emmaus was a means of escape. Maybe their walk to Emmaus was seeking to get clarity outside of Jerusalem, outside of the heaviness and the fear and the concern. Maybe they just need a good walk to gain some perspective. I wonder, as they walked, if they welcomed the stranger's questions or if they found him annoying. Do you ever have that where you feel peppered with questions by somebody and you don't really want to talk about it, leave me alone? I wonder. I wonder if they were offended or grateful to get to tell their story. I wonder if the hope that he offered that these things had to take place if it caused their pace to quicken or their hearts to lighten a little bit, he must have surprised them, don't you think? He knew so much. He seemed to understand exactly who Jesus was and what he did, even though he didn't know Jesus, even though he was a stranger. As they begin to see a little bit clearer, as he unfolds the story of faith to them, he points the way to God's work, even though they're still blind. Even as they begin to feel a little bit lighter and a little more hopeful, they still can't see. They don't recognize this stranger as a friend. When they reach the destination, they are doing what was absolutely expected and acceptable of those who lived in the ancient world. Hospitality was vital. And so inviting him to stay with them for evening is approaching, and the roads are not safe at night. It's not as if there are streetlights. It is not safe to wander the roads in the dark. Stay with us. Stay with us. Don't Continue your journey now. Continue in the morning. And so they gather around the table, and he takes the bread. He blesses it, and he breaks it. And in that moment, in that familiar action, they see, they know who this is who is with them. It's in the breaking of the bread. It's in the visible action that Jesus undertakes that they've seen him do so many other times that now they recognize him. The stories are true because it was Jesus who shared with them, who enlightened them, who defined himself on the road. 
They know who he is, and they know exactly who he was. Any doubt, any grief, any fear is now completely vanished. And so is Jesus. It is then with great joy that they leave the house and race back those seven miles. Fourteen miles in a day for us is a very long walk, right? But if you are ecstatic, if you are filled with joy and can't wait to get to your destination to tell the others what you have seen, that you have experienced Jesus, that you know who he is, how fast do you suppose they covered those seven miles? Much faster, I suspect, than the journey to Emmaus. They race towards Jerusalem, ready to share the good news Sometimes our faith is like the walk to Emmaus. Some days, weeks, months, we trudge. We put one foot in front of the other, trusting that we are being as faithful as we can with just one step. Maybe it is because something has shaken us to our core, a loss or a change in circumstances, someone else's pain or a betrayal, but there are dark times where all we can do with our faith is take one faithful, trudging step at a time. When we struggle, what we need most are friends who come alongside us, who help us reframe our experience to see that maybe things aren't as dark or even if they are, that we're not alone in the darkness. Sometimes we want to retreat in ourselves, right? Pull our heads inside of our shells and hide from the world. Sometimes we want to lash out at people who want to help. We get mad. Don't tell me anything's going to get any better. I'm not ready to hear it. These responses to the darkness just are. They are real. They are human. They are true because we humans deal with pain in unique and varied ways. Some people desperately want people gathered around them, and some people want to just be left alone. Some react with anger immediately, and some with deep despair. Sometimes our faith walks through dark valleys and up steep hills. On the other hand, sometimes our faith is like walking on a flat plain. You know, when the road isn't difficult, but it's not very exciting either. It's just ordinary. We find ourselves easily distracted then by things that are on the side of the road because it's just the way it is. We're just doing life. We may find our attention wandering our faith strong, but our practices of faith maybe not as steady, stable, active as they could be. Maybe we don't have quite the passion we believe, but, well, you know, life just is. Sometimes life and faith can be like that. We struggle to keep up the fire or the passion, the energy starts to lag a little bit, and we long for some renewal, something to talk about on the journey that keeps us energized, some project or new passion that will light a fire under us so that we're not just walking along. We look for fresh pools of water to refresh and revive us because things aren't bad. They're not great. They just are. And so we try to maintain our faith. And sometimes our faith feels like the way back from Emmaus. Sometimes our hearts and our heads can't even catch up with each other because things are really good. We are full of joy and excitement, ready to burst because we have some new understanding or some new experience of the Spirit. We're trying to explain to people something that they haven't seen or touched, or tasted, and so they don't quite get it, but we know. 
We know what the excitement is. We see this kind of joy in children when they're waiting for something exciting to happen, the way that they just kind of bubble, waiting for something that they have long anticipated. We see this hope, this joy, in someone who has lived a long, healthy life, who is ready and waiting because they know the end is near, and they are totally at peace with the idea that God will come for them soon. We see this knowing that we will one day meet our Savior. And so sometimes the road of life is hard. Sometimes it is just there. And sometimes it is a joy-filled journey. Faith is like that too. What our hearts and our heads need to know is that no matter which of those paths we happen to be walking at any particular time, God is with us in the journey. No matter what the road feels like for you, you are not walking alone. In the times of darkness and trudging, the Spirit is with us. In the time of flat ground, when we're doing fine, we're just doing, the Spirit is with us. And in the times of great joy and celebration, the Spirit laughs and bubbles and percolates beside us because we are never left alone. We are never abandoned. God is always with us. We're never left to our own devices without a guide, though sometimes Sometimes, God does provide us with those tangible supports around us, right? Sometimes we can see God active in the people around us, our friends or our neighbors or family who just keep showing up, whether we ask them to or not. Sometimes we can see that it's Jesus that is with us, helping us to see that he is revealing himself to us in a word of scripture, or in a dream, or in a moment of clarity. Wise guide, somebody who just seems to get it. But no matter where we find ourselves, no matter where we are on that path, God is with us, goes before us, and behind us, and walks beside us. Because people of God, we are never left alone. Jesus makes himself known to us again and again in the hearing of his word, in the breaking of the bread, in the repetition of familiar stories that we have heard before, and in new understandings, pieces that we never really saw clearly before. Jesus shows himself to us over and over again in the cup, in the bread, in the gathering of God's people faithfully each week, in the singing, in the preaching, in our prayers, and even in our silence. And so wherever you are today, trudging, dancing, just walking on flat ground, Jesus meets us here. Jesus is with us now. Whether it is a journey through struggle or hope, through joy or sorrow, we are not alone. God is with us in this journey, even if we don't always have eyes to see him clearly. Amen.
people of God, are there joys or concerns that you have to share with one another this morning? Deb. For Paul? Okay. And it's Paul? Okay. Yep, absolutely. Cheryl. You should be proud of her. So Courtney... Dr. Courtney graduating with her veterinary degree. Congratulations, Grandma. And to, and to Courtney. Caleb. Other joys or concerns, Teresa. Absolutely, the, the city and our nation. Absolutely. Other things, Andrew. William Dean, William Dean. Congratulations, Uncle Andrew. Other things. There are two prayer shawls on the front. Um, on Wednesday, my neighbor took his life, leaving a wife and seven-year-old. And so would you pray for Jenny? and for Carter, and on behalf of our congregation, we will be sharing those prayer shawls with them. Anything else? Let's pray together. Holy God, creator of the universe, holder of the world in your hands. We come today as people who journey, who journey through this life in moments of joy and sorrow, in moments of grief and hope. And we trust and we believe, Lord, that you are with us no matter where we are. And so we pray this morning we pray for the joys of this week. We give you thanks for graduations, for Dr. Courtney and her new life as a veterinarian. We give you thanks for new life, for the life of William Dean, for his birth, for his parents, for the life that you have given. We pray that you would make him strong. Lord, we pray for those who are in need. We pray for Paul, that you would walk beside him in his journey. We pray, Lord, for the violence of our city and our country. We ask, Lord, that you would ease what is a complex and never-ending series of incidences that roll together. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to find a way out of our systems and our patterns of violence towards one another. We pray for the city of Chicago in particular. Lord, we ask that you would walk beside Dali, Alanafe, and Yanko as they still are waiting. We ask that you would give them strength and protect them. We ask your comfort upon those who grieve. For those who have lost loved ones this week, Lord, 
and for those whose journey has been long and still continues. We ask your blessing and strength in particular for Jenny and for Carter. We ask God that you would give them what they stand in need of. Lord God, you are the one who heals. You are the one who comes beside us in all things. We ask that you would guide us and direct us. Help us as your people to go out into this world to join with others, to walk beside them, to offer hope or just comfort. We ask God that you would guide, that you would direct our steps. We ask this in faith and in confidence that your son came, that we might have life and have it abundantly as we pray together the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, we are going to sing together Thine is the Glory. It is number 238. If you are able, would you stand and sing together? People of God, wherever you find yourself today on this journey of faith, know that you do not walk alone. Know that the risen Christ is with us. And so go in peace. Go and share that good news with others that they also might know that we do not walk alone. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.